Welcome to Illinois in Focus. I'm Greg Bishop. Coming up, we'll review the week's top stories about the latest budget proposal from the Illinois State Board of Education and a new mental health survey being recommended for school districts across the state. I'll then join the Center Square's Dan McCaleb to further discuss those stories and more. That's ahead with Illinois in Focus. I'm Greg Bishop. Are you tired of news that puts politics over people? At the nonprofit Franklin News Foundation, we believe in putting people over politics by delivering nonpartisan news and audio content that serves you, the American taxpayer. With Franklin News Foundation, you can read fact-based, state-focused news for free at thecentersquare.com. You can listen to civil, balanced conversations between policy experts through our podcast network at americastalking.com. Or you can get in-depth news on K-12 education spending, curriculum, and school safety at chalkboardnews.com. It's all free through Franklin, where we put you, the American taxpayer, first in every story, episode, and conversation. And it's only possible through our supporters. Together, we can produce content that puts people over politics and brings Americans the news they deserve. Become a supporter today at franklinnews.org donate. Once again, that's franklinnews.org slash donate. Welcome back to Illinois in Focus. I'm Greg Bishop. Here are some of the top stories from the past week. The Illinois State Board of Education is aiming high in its requests for funding in the next budget year. Kevin Bessler has that story. The board is proposing a $653 million increase over last year in funding for K-12 schools, bringing the overall school budget for the next school year to $11 billion. Robin Staines is the president of the education advocacy group Advance Illinois. I was really encouraged to see them trying to bring some of the programming that we've put in place using federal dollars, bringing them into the state budget to be able to continue them. Regarding the chance the funding request will be granted with a possible state budget deficit, Staines says she is keeping her fingers crossed. I and many others were bracing ourselves for tough news, and I don't think we're out of the woods until we get through the governor budget address till we see what the General Assembly does. The budget proposal will head to Governor J.B. Pritzker for his consideration. He is scheduled to present his proposed budget to lawmakers on February 21st. I'm Kevin Bessler. Meanwhile, a new Illinois law recommends schools implement yearly mental health screenings for students enrolled in K-12 through grade. Katrina Peterson reports. Regan Deering, a Mount Zion School board member and State House candidate, said the new mental health screenings are a government expansion program being phased in this fall. The partnership, um, as far as I've sort of preliminarily read from the state guidance, has some concerns in me as far as who is administering uh, these surveys. The Illinois Youth Survey may be administered to middle and high school students at public and private schools. The survey asks questions about gender, drug use, suicide, and family dynamics. Mental health professionals and perhaps a, a professional evaluation. And it seems to me as though this youth health survey will be administered by more informal staff members or providers. And Deering said the Mount Zion superintendent has not heard of the surveys and the administration does not intend to utilize the survey. I'm Katrina Peterson. Those are the top stories from the past week from Illinois. Find more online at thecentersquare.com. Coming up for Illinois in Focus, I'll join the Center Square's Dan McCaleb to further discuss the news. This is Illinois in Focus, a production of America's Talking Network. I'm Greg Bishop. Knowledge is power, and you deserve to know what happens in your state government. That's why the nonprofit Franklin News Foundation is bringing you straight news journalism through the center square, reporting on state authorities and publishing stories that show where your money goes and who spends it. By supporting the center square, you can track politicians' use of taxpayer money and demand transparency from elected officials. This is how we can equip everyday Americans to hold their government accountable. Become a supporter of Franklin today at franklinnews.org donate. Greetings and welcome to Illinois in Focus, powered by the Center Square. I'm Dan McCaleb, Vice President of News and Content at the Franklin News Foundation, publisher of the Center Square Newswire Service. Joining me again today is Greg Bishop, the Center Square's Illinois Capitol Bureau Senior Reporter and Editor. Greg, how are you? I'm trying to find out if the weather's ever going to make up its mind. I mean, we had sub-zero temperature one day, and now it's looks like it's going to get up to 50 degrees next week down here. Uh, so are we really in winter, or is spring just around the corner? Well, I think you can expect more winter, Greg. It's only January. That's I, right. I'm, I'm sort of in the middle where during the day it gets to about, I'm up in the Chicago suburbs, it gets to about uh, 
33, 34, enough to make a little bit of a melt off, but then it gets down below freezing at night, and so I wake up to an ice patch on my porch and front walkway every morning. So we'll see. But anyway, we do have some news to talk about uh, this week, as we always do. We are recording this on Thursday, January 25th. Uh, Greg, the ongoing migrant crisis in Chicago and really across the entire state of Illinois, it continues to be among the biggest issues. There were several developments in the past week, including the revelation that Governor J.B. Pritzker and Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson aren't entirely on the same page when it comes to the response. We'll get into some of the other developments in a bit, but let's start there. Yeah. So, uh, of course, in the past uh, 15 months or so, the state of Illinois has been uh, at the receiving end of more than 30,000 non-citizen migrants uh, being transported from the southern U.S. border to Chicago and also to some of the neighboring suburbs of Chicago. Uh, and this has caused a huge uh, drain on available resources. The state's taxpayers have paid more than half a billion dollars just in housing and other costs associated with the ongoing migrant crisis. But one of the big things that's uh, really seeming to drive a divide between Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson and Governor J.B. Pritzker, who are both of the Democrat Party, deals with resource allocation, and in particular, that of where we're going to have certain shelters set up. So we've had a lot of conversation about you know the buses and how they're going to regulate those buses and even various communities across the state trying to uh, have a patchwork of sorts of different regulations to prohibit buses from dropping non-citizens off unannounced. Uh, so while the governor says the legislature could possibly evaluate how to bring about uniformity to all of that, Really, the question that is top of mind for many is what's going to happen with these shelters? So uh, Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson this week announced that he was actually going to be extending the 60 day limit for migrants to stay in shelters. Looks like he's going to push that past to the uh, first of the month in February. Uh, so that's uh, impacting where people ultimately end up staying. But uh, earlier in the week, Governor J.B. Pritzker said that he was concerned with the uh, lack of shelters in Chicago. So the governor made his comments uh, about uh, how the city of Chicago doesn't seem to be moving fast enough and getting new shelters built and set up. Uh, but there's also that concern of uh, the quality of the shelters as well. But uh, Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson fired back and he said that, uh, you know, to the question of are they on the same page? Uh, Johnson said that that's not a good way to characterize it. But then Johnson went on to say that the state of Illinois can set up migrant shelters wherever they want, uh, not just in Chicago, but elsewhere. And Johnson went on to talk about the 1,500 different municipalities across the states and how the governor can you know, use state taxpayer dollars to incentivize communities to set up shelters in their, lo their jurisdictions. But uh, Johnson said that even then, you know, the 40 plus million dollars, the 10 million dollars that's been uh, offered up as grants to local communities to take in migrants. A lot of local communities are not accepting that offer. Uh, but uh, obviously, there seems to be a continued conflict and uh, some questions about who should be making the call as to where shelters go. Chicago says that they're doing what they can to set up shelters as rapidly as they can. Uh, while the they're pointing blame at the state, saying that the state's not doing enough uh, to use the allocated dollars to set up these shelters. So clearly, uh, the, the issue of resource allocation and the issue of where shelters are ultimately going to go, uh, there's a lot of back and forth. And this all also stems around the idea of sanctuary city policies. You know, the Chicago mayor says they're going to remain a welcoming city and the governor uh, downplays any effort to try to end the state's sanctuary policy. Uh, but a lot of communities across the state, Dan, are eyeballing the idea of becoming non-sanctuary counties. Uh, so we'll be continuing to track that as well. But clearly, uh, while they say they, they're not, not on the same page, there's obviously some conflict between the Chicago mayor and uh, Governor Pritzker. Yeah, Greg, and, and there's been questions, too, about whether or not, you know, the state should be spending this much taxpayer dollars 
on this issue to be to be to begin with. Legislature they they were off this week, so really no new news on this from the legislature. But they're likely to be asked to pass a supplemental spending bill. Some are accusing Pritzker and Johnson of, of, of prioritizing migrant care over the state's many other needs. Do you see this as being a legislative battle here when they return to session? Considering that the Democrats have a supermajority in both chambers, uh, if there is some conflict, it's likely going to be behind closed doors. Uh, We already have the new arrivals working group in the Illinois House that is just House Democrats and working groups typically work behind closed doors and have conversations about these things. So uh, while there may be some some discussions and some debates, apparently that's going to be behind closed doors. So we may not see that much. However, Republicans are adamant that the first steps that need to be taken before anything else is to close the southern U.S. border. And several Republicans who recently traveled to the southern U.S. border uh, demanding that uh, the governor and the mayor put more pressure on the Biden administration to close the southern U.S. border. And then the next step is to, according to Republicans, end the state's sanctuary policies for non-citizen migrants. And that's the policy of uh, especially for statewide Uh, Local law enforcement, state law enforcement are prohibited by state law from working with federal immigration authorities to go after migrants who have orders of uh, detainment uh, from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. If that's the only thing they have against them, then state police and local police can't assist Immigration and Customs Enforcement from going after people. So that is uh, obviously an issue that uh, Republicans are saying needs to be reversed, especially as Republicans have said that, uh, you know, the the idea that they're all asylum seekers, the 30 plus thousand who've come to Chicago and elsewhere in Illinois, uh, saying they're all asylum seekers, Republicans doubt that. They point to statistics that show that uh, a vast majority of individuals seeking asylum are not granted asylum. So, for instance, State Senator Andrew Chesney had previously said that we need to reverse the sanctuary city and state policies especially if it turns out that the vast majority of these non-citizen migrants are here illegally and not granted asylum. There should be deportation orders that are followed, and local law enforcement should be able to assist ICE in doing that. So Republicans have their own ideas of what needs to happen here, but that seems to be contrary to the ideas that uh, we may see debated and ultimately approved at the Illinois State House, which would be just more funding, more taxpayer dollars going to this issue. Uh, Instead of getting to the root cause, closing the border or addressing the state's uh, migrant sanctuary policies. Greg, when it comes to um, this closing the southern border as Illinois Republicans and really Republicans across the country want, I don't know if you've been paying attention. We won't spend a lot of time on this because this is Illinois in focus. But I, I don't know if over the past couple of days you see that you've seen this growing dispute and it's really it's it's snowballing right now between Texas the state of Texas and Governor Greg Abbott and the Biden administration over the southern border but we do have some other things here to talk about in Illinois we talked at the end of 2023 uh, that Illinois loan school choice program the invest in kids scholarship program expired the legislature democratic controlled legislature did not uh, pass anything to extend it and now a couple of schools, early into 2024, a number, a number, a couple of schools have closed. Private schools have closed that were that were taking in or are closing that have taken in a number of those uh, school choice scholarship program kids, and they're blaming it on the end of investing kids. Tell us a little bit about that, and whether you think the legislature, because of this, decides to address it. Yeah, obviously, uh, anytime you hear that a school's closing, uh, I can definitely uh, peak people's attention. Uh, And in this case, you had a couple of private schools that uh, decided because the majority of their students or if not half of their students were receiving these scholarships that are no longer available heading into a new school year next year, uh, they can't sustain themselves. So they announced that they're going to be closing in June of this year. Uh, Now, could this just be uh, one off? I guess we'll see. But the indication is, especially from the Catholic Conference, which uh, helps manage some of these uh, parochial schools that have been uh, the recipient of these privately funded 
scholarships for uh, kids and parents to to go to the school of their choice. Uh, these these schools, uh, they're, they could possibly see even more schools have to close uh, because of the uh, the lack of such funding. Now, uh, will this be enough to to put pressure on the legislature to address the Investing Kids School Choice Scholarship Program? And what would that look like? Would it be just reinstating it as it was, or would they look to try to you know reduce the amount of the tax credit that people could get? If they were to donate to the Investing Kids School Choice Scholarship Program, if it was to be reinstated, uh, clearly this is a, a huge issue that impacted uh, legislators heading into the end of fall veto session before the end of the year last year with uh, zero debate on any committees. Uh, but you did have a whole host of Republicans regularly, anytime they were on the floor of either the House or the Senate, raise issue with the lack of movement on any debate, any negotiations, and despite there being a bipartisan bill to uh, bring about a reinstatement of the Investing Kids School Choice Scholarship Program, albeit reducing the tax credits and reducing how much money could be donated privately. All of these things never really came to uh, any movement, and that uh, has led to, uh, to some problems with, as we're talking about here, some schools eyeballing the the possibility of having to close, if not announcing they're going to close. So um, obviously, when they come back February 6th, uh, they've got a full docket ahead of them. Of course, the budgets they've got to deal with. You've got uh, the Illinois State Board of Education asking for even more tax resources for the upcoming school year. Uh, but when it came to this uh, privately funded tax credit school choice scholarship program, the only school choice program that Illinois had that the legislature allowed to die and allowed to sunset, uh, whether or not that's going to be part of this equation has yet to be seen because they've got the budget they've got to deal with. They've got the migrant crisis they've got to deal with. But we will be on the ground every day from gavel to gavel covering what happens with the Illinois legislature for spring session. So I encourage everyone to make a daily uh, habit of checking out the centersquare.com slash Illinois. One final point on the school choice thing, but before we move on, Greg, and that's just, I think it's important to note that it's lower income families, students who come from lower income families that are being hurt by school closures, by the lack of these school scholarships. For whatever reason, their families, their parents decided that their local public school was not working for them, thought they could get a better education at a school of their choice, like these private schools. But that option is no longer going to be available to them unless the legislature acts. Let's move on. Interesting story, and I was kind of curious about this story. Um, Illinois Secretary of State Alex Janulius is promoting legislation that would ban certain food additives in Illinois, would make them the strictest in the uh, nation. How is the Secretary of State getting involved in what kind of food additives are sold in grocery stores, etc.? Yeah, it's uh, it is interesting because, uh, of course, the the legislation being proposed would come from the legislature. It's called the Illinois Food Safety Act, and it looks to prohibit the use of certain additives in foods like uh, uh, brominated vegetable oil, red dye number three, uh, titanium dioxide. Some of these things are preservatives that uh, certain types of processed foods utilize in the process of making their products. Uh, and, and some studies have shown that uh, these could be linked to uh, hormonal damage or in re increased risk of cancer or reproductive issues or hyperactivity and other uh, serious health problems. So where um, the Secretary of State, Alexei Janulius, gets involved here, he supports the legislation because the Secretary of State in Illinois oversees the organ donation program and Janulius uh, during a news conference with uh, sponsors of the bill earlier this week, he said that, uh, you know, it's dependent on healthy organs being available of individuals uh, so that those who need them can get those healthy organs. Uh, and if they're uh, somehow uh, damaged because of these food additives, they're looking to essentially prohibit uh, the Secretary of State said that that is very much uh, on his mind. Uh, so that's kind of where the Secretary of State uh, plays into this. But this overall conversation 
you know, clearly uh, it's going to be um, interesting to see it play out uh, in the legislature uh, because even the sponsors have said that uh, they expect, quote, very powerful interests to oppose the bill. And instantly after this was announced, you had the Illinois Manufacturers Association sending out statements saying that it's well intentioned. But they warn it would set a dangerous precedent by usurping the role of scientists and experts from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. You also have the National Confectioners Association speaking out, saying that the bill would replace a uniform national food safety system with a patchwork of inconsistent state requirements. So in the United States, when you've got you know 50 states and the District of Columbia, uh, all of them, if they were to have different standards for these types of bans or what could be or not put into foods, uh, you can clearly see that it would make it extremely difficult for these food manufacturers uh, to have consistency across the board. But uh, one thing that uh, the Secretary of State did do during his news conference is he held up a bag of Skittles, a bag of Skittles from the European Union that he said does not contain these things. And he made that a point saying if the European Union, if this company can make these brand of Skittles that are uh, compliant with European Union rules, then they should be able to do such a thing here in the state of Illinois. But again, would the state of Illinois be different than Missouri or how exactly would this impact such food yeah. manufacturers? Uh, so clearly this is going to be an interesting one to watch play out over the duration of the spring session. Something we'll definitely be covering at the center square.com. One final story. We only have a couple of minutes left, Greg. So we're going to have to get through this one quickly. We wrote at the center square.com that the number of swatting calls, In just a moment, I'm going to have you explain what swatting is. But the number of swatting calls in Illinois grew three times higher in 2023 than they did than what we had in 2022. First, what's swatting calls? What is that? And what's behind it? Uh, I'll do my best. I've never been the victim of a swatting call. I hope to never be the victim of a swatting call. But, uh, Dan, what it is is... Uh, this seemed to have been spurred on by, uh, you know, opposing gangs going after each other or even gamers, people online uh, going after each other. Um, what it is, is somebody will make a bogus call to local law enforcement saying that uh, either they are somebody they're not and they just committed a, a vicious crime of violence against somebody or they, they call and they, they allege that they're an individual at a house and they're getting ready to do harm to themselves. Themselves. Essentially, it's a fake call to local law enforcement prompting a SWAT team to arrive at a location that the assailant wants that police force to perform SWAT tactics on. And this is something that is uh, extremely troubling because when you have SWAT teams show up with armored vehicles and paramilitary type of equipment to breach a home, uh, that puts not just those in the home who may be innocent in harm's way, but it could also put law enforcement in harm's way. Uh, So this is a trend that we've seen across the country more and more. Uh, and it uh, seems to be a, a, an ongoing issue that, that law enforcement have to contend with. Waste of time, waste of police resources who who have actual crimes um, to prevent and to investigate and whatnot. I, I hope um, these swatters, if that's what they're called, are found and prosecuted um, to the fullest extent of the law, if I can use that cliche, Greg. But we are out of time. Listeners can keep up with this story and all of the stories we talked about today and even more at thecentersquare.com. For Greg Bishop, I'm Dan McCaleb. Please subscribe. Thank you for listening.